Okay. Um, let's start by going over the homework uh, for today. So the first problem is to write the posterior kernel uh, for the baseline model in the Humphreys and Jacobs paper using log units. And so, again, I don't know that the question necessarily made this 100% clear, but this is the sort of thing that we're going to do when we get into STAN. We'll be using the STAN language rather than the R language, but the goal will be the same, to take inputs, uh, those being the parameters and the data, and whatever you want to use uh, for the inputs that go into your priors, and produce the logarithm of the posterior kernel, the logarithm of the numerator of the right-hand side of Bayes' law, and that's what Stan needs uh, in order to do its thing. You can include the constants, exclude the constants, uh, it's not going to matter. Uh, that would be the same procedure if we were using Metropolis Hastings, which we're not because it's not a very good MCMC algorithm, um, but it would be the same process. You have to define what posterior distribution you're trying to draw from, and for uh, numerical reasons, we always do the logarithm rather than um, literally doing the numerator of, of, of Bayes' rule. And so you can write the logarithm of the posterior PDF as being something that's additively proportional to the log of your priors. Oftentimes, when you have multiple parameters in your prior, uh, we'll assume they're independent a priori, in which case you could break this down into the product of a prior on a uh, prior PDF on gamma, another one on pi, and another one on phi. Anyway, uh, if you multiply those products together and take the logarithm of, of them, it becomes the sum of the log PDF of your priors. And then you want to add on to it the logarithm uh, of the likelihood for the data, which again is going to be considered a function of the parameters gamma pi and phi, but evaluated at constants for in whatever the data is, in this case, the number of observations <laughs> in each uh, category, whether we uh, seek clues for those observations or not. But whatever your data are, there'll be some log likelihood function of the parameters uh, for them. <laughs> um, so hopefully this formulation ought to make clear that in simple models, when you have a fair amount of data, it doesn't matter that much what your prior beliefs are uh, because of these two pieces, you know, the prior for each of these sort of contributes one piece each, and the log likelihood is summed over all the log likelihood contributions for each of the data points. So if you have a lot of data points, much more of the posterior distribution is attributable to the information and the log likelihood function rather than your priors. However, uh, Humphreys and Jacobs explicitly intends this to be used uh, in situations where you might not have a lot of data because collecting data, is, qualitative data, is expensive to do. So questions about what we're trying to Dude, thank you. Uh, I think I'm just allergic to the chalk. Um, in problem one. All right. So let's do it. So this over here on the right-hand side, in the R sense, it's a function of the parameters of the counts in each category. And I didn't, well, I wrote them over here. Uh, your alphas and betas that go into the beta prior distributions for the pi and the phi. So parameters, counts for the number of observations when you don't see clues, counts for the observations when you do see clues, first shape parameter on the beta distributions for the pi's, uh, 
first shape parameter, second shape parameter on the beta prior distributions for the fees. Those seven things are all you need to evaluate the right hand side up here. If this function were to get called, theta changes. We have different proposals for theta, so we could evaluate this function for different values of theta, but the counts stay the same. Your prior shape parameters stay the same, so only theta is changing here. Uh, the rest of these inputs are going to be static. All right. Uh, so I believe the problem set gave you the first three lines where you can separate the whole uh, parameter vector theta of link 16 into three parts, first four of which are the gammas, next four of which are the pi's, one for each type, and the last eight of which are the phi's, and those are conditional both on the unknown observations type or the observations unknown type and the known value of x, which is either 0 or 1 in the baseline case. <clears throat> so uh, I think you, know, you had to fill everything else out from there. Uh, so it doesn't matter entirely what order you do things. But uh, one of the things that you need to do is convert from gamma, which are just positive numbers, to lambda, which is a simplex vector. So it's going to be non-negative and add up to 1. We do that by dividing gamma by the sum of the gammas, and that can be shown, as was asserted on the problem set, uh, to yield a simplex vector. So here, lambda is kind of an intermediate quantity. It's entirely determined by what gamma is, and we're going to put a prior on gamma such that lambda is uniformly distributed among simplex vectors. That's our prior uh, beliefs about lambda expressed in terms of our prior beliefs about gamma. So questions about that line? Yes? How interested the function is the function? The what function? The function. In MCMC pack? Um, no, because you need some way of ensuring that well, yes, you could use the D Dirichlet uh, in the function in the MCMC pack package. However, you would have to have a term for the absolute value of the logarithm of the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian of the transformation from lambda to gamma. Uh, which is that sort of multivariate change of variable stuff that we had in order to define a posterior distribution on gamma. Now, when we do this in Stan, it's actually going to be easier because there's a simplex type. So you can just say lambda is a simplex and you don't have to worry about gamma. But otherwise, when it's making proposals, uh, if you were to define lambda as your primitive, uh, there would be no way of enforcing that lambda is actually a simplex vector. So we have to do it in terms of gamma. All right. Uh, so the next line here, I just defined some quantities A, B, C, and D as being consecutive integers. Hopefully make the code a little bit easier to read. And so the next thing I'm going to do is define these W vectors, which are also simplex vectors, and these are the uh, parameters that go into the log likelihood function. This is the first batch that uh, only is of length four because these are the observations for which we do not seek clues. Uh, and the, you know, these W's, uh, or these particular W's, they depend on the values of lambda, and they uh, depend on the values of pi. And so these, I believe, uh, are in the article or in the appendix somewhere, or they were definitely uh, in the slides, that we just, you know, apply these formulas uh, and we get out W. Now, it's a good thing, at least uh, when you're uh, developing one of these functions, 
to check to make sure you didn't make a mistake. Now you might want to comment out these lines if you were doing this after you've established your function is working correctly uh, because it will, um, you know, make it run a little bit faster. So we want to check that all the W's are greater than or equal to zero because W has to be a simplex vector. And we also want to check uh, whether up to some numerical tolerance, the sum of the W vector is equal to one. And we can do that with this construction here. Wrap it all and stop if not. So if either of these conditions were false, the function would error out. Uh, but in this case, I believe I've done it correctly. Uh, and so this line uh, would get executed but not um, do anything. So questions about uh, W for observations where we don't have clues? All right, then we need to do a similar exercise <clears throat> to create a simplex vector to use as the parameter for the log likelihood contribution using the observations where we do randomly seek clues. And now there's eight possibilities for what a binary X, Y, and K could be. Again, I'm just gonna paste some names on defeat to make my code uh, a little bit easier. Um, so this comes from the slides. In the original version of the slides, um, I messed up some of these formulas, uh, but um, shortly after the homework assignment was posted, I uh, corrected the lecture slides from February 21st and put up a, a note on Piazza about that. So I think everybody managed to at least be dealing with the right formulas. Uh, and all you got to do is type them out. It's a little bit tedious, um, <clears throat> but uh, it's just multiplication, addition, and subtraction. That's all. Again, particularly for this one, we want to check that it satisfies the necessary and sufficient conditions for W being a simplex vector. Um, in this case, this line is going to pass without erroring. <clears throat> and so once we have the W's, uh, we're ready to evaluate the posterior uh, kernel, uh, except in log units. And so some people were sort of trying to write out the uh, expressions for like multinomial PMF, beta, PDF, etc. That's fine, but you don't need to do that. And oftentimes you wouldn't need to do that at stand. You just need to use the built-in functions that evaluate you know, these PMFs or PDFs, they'll do it with the constants, but it's no particularly big deal there. You just need to specify log equal true to each of them uh, and sum them all up, which is done by the sum function. So we have a likelihood contribution uh, using W no K and counts no K. We have a likelihood contribution or log likelihood contribution using uh, counts with K and W with K. So those two lines together constitute the likelihood of the parameters. Uh, we have a gamma prior on gamma with shape one and rate one. We have beta priors on pi and on phi using the shape parameters that we passed in uh, as arguments to the function. Everything with log equal true, wrap it all up in sum and return it and you're done. All right, so basically the steps are, you know, separate out the, the long parameter vector into something that's uh, specific to your problem. Calculate any intermediate quantities you need to evaluate the log likelihood. <clears throat> and then check that you did it correctly. And then actually do evaluate the log likelihood, add it to the log PDF for the priors, all that added up together is the log kernel of the posterior distribution that you're seeking, or at least the one that uh, Humphreys and Jacobs was seeking. Uh, and if you wanted to check it, you could just put in some admissible values of the parameters and verify that 
uh, it doesn't, um, you know, error, it actually gives out a number, in this case, like negative 41, and that's because it's the sum of the logarithms of a lot of numbers that are pretty close to zero. And so the logarithms are negative, we add it all up, we get a moderately large negative number, but one that a computer can easily, you know, handle to a lot of decimal places. Questions? Okay. Um, so the second question asks you to come up with a model for wages. Uh, each of you had a different state, and moreover, each of you uh, might have come up with a slightly different model for uh, explaining the variation and the logarithm of wages. I used uh, New York here um, and came up with a model based on the class of the worker uh, and the gender of the worker with a lot of interaction terms. So I have, you know, squared terms for schooling, interacting, you know, age and gender and class of worker. So um, <clears throat> this is not like a complicated model, uh, but it has, I think about uh, 29 or 30 coefficients in it to estimate when you expand out um, all these interactions, um, and that's fine. Uh, should be able to estimate a model like this pretty well, because at least in New York, there's some 200,000 observations um, from the 5% of the census that we're working with here who have you know, non-zero wages, so they at least worked for some time during the year. All right? So you could have come up with a different model. Um, and moreover, you could have had a different prior as to you know, how much of the variation in log wages could be attributed to this linear model. Um, I was perhaps optimistic. Uh, I put in 0 0.6 as my prior median, which is to say I believe there was a 50% chance that it would be less than 0.6, a 50% chance that it would be greater than 0.6. Uh, the R2 function in the R stand arm package, by default, uh, you specify what you believe is the prior mode, but you could also do the prior median or the prior mean. Uh, indeed, you have to use the prior median or the prior mean when you have two or fewer predictors because the prior mode is not defined for the beta distribution uh, when there are two or fewer predictors, not counting the intercept. Um, so I put in 0 0.6 as my prior median, ran this model, uh, got back the following results, which because of all the interaction terms would be rather difficult to interpret. But if I was interested in some particular parameter like schooling, I could easily come up with a plot of like, the posterior predictive distribution of wages as a function of schooling, you know, for men, for women, for uh, people in you know, different uh, class jobs, etc. <clears throat> the uh, question that was actually asked was, you know, is the posterior distribution of R squared, um, you know, is its median less than or bigger than? Uh, what you believed going in. And in this case, I have a posterior median belief about the R squared of 0.37, which is considerably less than what I believed going in. And that's fine. Uh, so I've learned to be less optimistic about how much of the variation in log wages in New York uh, this model can explain. And it also emphasizes that your prior beliefs uh, don't matter all that much when you have 200,000 observations to condition on. It's just going to go uh, wherever the data tell it to in terms of the posterior distribution on not just the R-squared, but the rest of these parameters here. Questions about that? Yes? Yes. 
Eh. Uh, so when this is zero or when this is negative, it tends to indicate the model is underfitting. And when it's positive, it tends to indicate the model is overfitting. Uh, it should be it should be pretty close to zero almost always. Yes. Some of the models I track are diverging. That just means they're really bad models. Yep. Uh, and it's difficult for span to uh, deal with them. We haven't talked about that case yet, but there should have been a link that you could click on that explains more information. We'll cover that when we, you know, get to models where it's not just, you know, you had a bad model, but you have a decent model and it's hard to fit. Yes. If I put a prior R squared that was low and I use what equals median, it wouldn't run, but if I did what equals low, it would run. Sure it's not the other way around? How many predictors were you using? Okay. Well, uh, Terry, you'll have to look at it. I'm not sure. Oh, did it say it couldn't get started? So error with initial value, something like that? Okay. Uh, there's a way to like make the starting values be closer together, in which case it can overcome some of those problems. Um, but yeah, honestly, if you're around 0.5, the mean, median, and mode are very similar numbers to each other. So. Okay, so the rest of the question came from the posterior predictive distribution, or the answers should come from the posterior predictive distribution. Um, so because there's so many observations, I just use, in the problem said to just use like 30 draws from the posterior predictive distribution. That's more or less fine uh, if you're talking about a function of interest being an aggregate function. Uh, you could have done, you know, up to 4,000, but since you have so many observations that might have actually caused some of your computers to crash, uh, which is you know not really necessary on a homework assignment. Um, so we get this uh, posterior predictive distribution. It's going to have 30 rows and like 200,000 uh, columns, one for each observation you have in the data with positive wages. If you had a big state, if you had a smaller state, it could have you know fewer columns. And so one of the questions, well, what's the average wage among workers uh, implied by the model? And it's about 60000 And that may seem a bit high to you. But remember, an average uh, is a function of the whole distribution. Uh, and the distribution of wages, even more so the distribution of income, is highly skewed. And so you have people like Donald Trump or whatever uh, who are contributing to the uh, mean in an outsized fashion, even though Donald Trump probably doesn't have any income from wages. Uh, but there's other rich people who do. Um, so what's the standard deviation of wages implied by the model? Um, <clears throat> comes out to some huge number, again, reflecting the extreme skew in the distribution of wages. And that can perhaps be quantified best by the last question, which is uh, where does the top 1% of wages start? You can use the quantile function, putting in a uh, prob of 0.99, and you find that your model entails that in New York, uh, the top 1% of wages starts at half a million dollars. It seems a huge amount for wages, so not counting like dividends or capital gains or anything like that. Um, but anyway, that's the way New York is. And actually, this model, uh, you know, it's not quite right, you know, for probably a variety of reasons, but for reasons that we haven't even gotten into, in the census data, the income is top coded. So in the original data, if you list you know, wages of like more than 400,000 or something like that, it varies depending on what state. Uh, you're just you know, put in as 400,000. And so to deal with this appropriately, we would have to consider those to be missing values that have a lower bound of 400,000 or uh, whatever it may be. Um, and that would cause you know, the estimates to be 
a little bit more, a little bit di uh, different, and consequently the posterior predictive distribution to be, you know, even more skewed. Um, and some of these estimates of mean and standard deviation and quantiles, um, you know, would be even uh, larger if we took that into consideration. Martin? Yeah, I was a little bit confused about whether it makes sense to calculate the mean standard deviation and quantile across all draws or whether you would draw it by line, sort of calculate these things by line and then. Uh, for the mean, it shouldn't matter at all. Uh, for the other ones, um, it sort of depends on exactly what you're looking for, and I don't even remember exactly what the question was, you know, phrased as. Um, but uh, yeah, you could do this uh, row-wise, and then you know, take the average of those or something like that. I think you'd come out with something uh, very similar. Um, you know, particularly in a state like New York or California, just like. Huge, because the, the the examples that I found online for for our stenar, they they think tended to do this, but I think they were projected into into new data. Yeah, yeah. So this is with the you know existing data. You could have projected into like 2014 or 2015. Um, you know these data were from 2013. Yeah. Come on. Um, well, R squared is actually a parameter in the model. Adjusted R squared isn't a parameter in the model, so R squared isn't a generated quantity. It's a, a it's something that's declared in the parameters block. So by this we mean, um, you know, the proportion of variance attributable to the predictors in a linear model. However, uh, there, in a manner of speaking, is an adjustment because this prior is a, a beta with a first shape parameter equal to k over 2. And so your prior um, actually does depend on the number of uh, predictors that you're using, the k. Any other questions about the homework? OK. Uh, so moving on uh, to the topic for today. Uh, we'll be talking about model comparison. Uh, we're not going to be talking about how uh, you can't listen to me. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, today we want to talk about competing models. We won't have anything uh, next week uh, because it's spring break, so no office hours, no lectures, no review session. You can post on Piazza, uh, but that's about it. So uh, this idea of leave, leave one out cross-validation is uh, pretty prevalent, not just in the Bayesian uh, literature, although uh, it can be. So suppose you omitted the ith observation uh, from your model, obtained draws from the posterior distribution whose PDF is f of theta given y negative i, where negative i means all the values of y except the ith using sort of r uh, syntax there. And then once you obtain that draws from that posterior distribution, you evaluated the log likelihood for the ith observation. So uh, the observation putting in draws of theta and evaluating it at the ith value of y. So there's certainly nothing stopping you from doing that. And you know you could do that in times, each time leaving out one observation calculating this posterior distribution of the log likelihood evaluated at the held out observation and you know summing that all up or taking the average or other sorts of summary statistics that you might want uh, to do on that. So that's all conceptually pretty straightforward. However, uh, one big problem with that is it would take a lot of time to do. We just did a model with like 200,000 people uh, in order to do leave one out cross validation for all observations, we would have to estimate that model 200,000 times. Um, so that would take a long time and it would be uh, pretty unreliable because at least one out of those 200,000 times, uh, like the chains will go in the wrong place or you'll run into like problems with starting values and you know the whole thing will error out. 
Um, so that's not particularly realistic. But uh, using um, you know ideas that have been developed relatively recently, it is possible, and quite possible, uh, for you to estimate what would happen if you did all that. And the only thing you need in order to estimate that is the posterior draws that you obtained from estimating your model once uh, using the entire vector of data uh, on Y. You just have to add one additional assumption, uh, which is actually verifiable, but one additional assumption that no individual observation in your data set has an unduly large influence on the posterior distribution. You need them all to have sort of a relatively similar kind of small, uh, at least on a one by one basis, uh, influence on the posterior distribution of theta conditional on the data. And we'll be able to check that assumption. Um, but it's, it's pretty weak and this enables you to estimate the model once and estimate you know, what would happen if you did actual leave one out cross validation. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, it helps when doing that to have uh, some definitions. These actually come from a book that we didn't read uh, this year. It was on the syllabus for last year. Uh, but it had, a in chapter six, I think a pretty clear uh, explanation of this. And if you want to, uh, you can find a copy of this book uh, in the QMSS office. So it provides the following definitions. One is information. So what's information? It's the reduction in uncertainty about theta or some other unknown that you obtain um, by conditioning on the data, the outcomes. Um, so the reduction in certainty about theta due to conditioning on Y is the information provided by Y. <clears throat> so how do we measure information? Turns out uh, it's fairly uncontroversial that the only measure of um, uncertainty and uncertainty reduction that satisfies some reasonable axioms uh, for measuring these things is called the entropy, which we referred to uh, probably about a month ago as the expectation of a particular function. And that function that we're taking the expectation of is the negative of the logarithm of some PDF or PMF. Uh, in this case, I just wrote it generically as X. And so there's a lot of theoretical reasons why this should really be the measure that you focus on when you're talking about how much uncertainty is there, how much uncertainty you know got eliminated by conditioning on the data, uh, et cetera. There's another concept called KL divergence or Kolbach uh, Liebler divergence, uh, which is um, defined as the additional amount of uncertainty that is induced into the process by using one distribution to describe a different distribution. <clears throat> and that can be uh, written as a function of you know, the first distribution F and a base distribution F sub naught it's the expectation of the log ratio of those two things. Again, you know, with respect to the uh, random variable in question. And so if you, you know, you have some distribution, it's not quite normal, but you sort of describe it with a normal distribution, you're having additional uncertainty being introduced in that process. And the additional uncertainty can be quantified uh, by the KL divergence which is the ratio of sort of the true uh, distribution to the base distribution. Uh, or, yeah, so in this case, F would be the normal, and the true distribution, whatever that is, would be F sub naught. But the closer um, the base distribution is to the distribution you're using, then that log ratio uh, or that ratio becomes closer to one everywhere, the logarithm of it is zero everywhere and the expectation of zero is zero. So the, the KL divergence is actually a non-negative quantity, which is good because it'd be difficult to interpret negative values uh, for something like that. <clears throat>
Um, so the KL divergence is related to the deviance. Uh, so the deviance for an entire sample is defined as negative 2 times the sum of uh, the log likelihood, or in this case I've written as the log PDF before you observe uh, the data. <clears throat> and since that depends on theta, this deviance has a posterior distribution over the values that you've drawn uh, from theta. So we shouldn't think of deviance as like a scalar, although that's kind of typical from a frequentist perspective. Rather, we want to think of this deviance as having its own distribution uh, that is uh, brought about from having a distribution of beliefs about theta. So you could put in your prior uh, distribution for theta, you could put in your posterior distribution for theta. Either way, deviance is a function of that, and so you get this posterior or prior distribution uh, over the deviance, which is just negative 2 times the sum of the log likelihood uh, contributions. Uh, the final uh, important thing that McElreath emphasizes is that we need some joint probability measure um, that's a function of theta rather than an average probability. And so that's why in the deviance uh, we're just summing rather than dividing by n or anything like that um, or you know taking a, another expectation with respect to theta uh, because we want um, – our, our measurements to depend on sort of all the observations, our, our measurements of uncertainty to depend on all the observations collectively rather than, you know, some average, uh, which may not be suitable uh, for any particular data point, particularly if you have like a bimodal distribution or uh, something like that, the average is not particularly meaningful. But the joint uh, probability distribution over everything uh, definitely is. And it can be shown uh, for large samples that this leave one out cross-validation business that I was referring to previously converges to the out-of-sample deviance. And so particularly for people who like to emphasize prediction, um, the deviance is really the right measure to be focusing on from a from a Bayesian perspective, and this uh, leave one out cross validation business uh, converges as n goes to infinity to the out of sample deviance. Now the in sample deviance is not very useful or important uh, because again, you know you're you're evaluating your model based on the same data that you obtain the posterior distribution of theta on. Uh, but the out-of-sample deviance, the deviance for a future data set of size n, uh, we can't evaluate directly, even though it's sort of conceptually exactly the thing that we might want if we're interested in predictive accuracy. But we can calculate something that for large-ish samples and simple enough models converges to that, doing this leave one out uh, cross-validation business. And we're not actually going to have to leave anything out. All we have to do in order to estimate this is to obtain the posterior distribution of theta once per model. Um, and then, you know, we can do some stuff. And once we have this thing that converges to deviance, we can use that to compare different models for the same outcome uh, as to which one is going to have a higher probability of predicting better for future data. All right? So does everybody understand these concepts? Nigel? Sorry, I just don't get what the deviance exactly is measuring. Is it measuring the deviance against the posterior distribution? Or? Uh, right. So it's just the logarithm of the PDF for the data. I wrote it as a PDF rather than a log likelihood because to emphasize future data. So future data is a random variable. Um, but we can get the posterior distribution of theta, and if we were willing to wait for the future data to arrive, we could just evaluate this sum and multiply it by negative 2, and we'd have deviance. But rather than waiting for the future data to arrive, we can uh, approximate that well with large n uh, 
using the leave one out and we can say even before the future data arrives you know this model which produces this posterior distribution is probably going to be better than this other model that produces a different posterior distribution uh, on the metric out of sample deviance even without waiting for the future data uh, to arrive okay so how is this estimated it sounds a little bit like magic uh, there's actually many ways to estimate out of sample deviance some of which even have sort of a frequentist justification uh, but the one we're going to use is thoroughly bayesian uh, and it's also the best one uh, so this is known as the leave one out information criterion lu ic uh, and it's the best because it makes the weakest assumptions about the data generating process uh, and it's also the most robust easiest to verify when it's not working well um, it uses something it's talked about it in the reading for today called important sampling or Pareto smooth important sampling to reduce the noise uh, in the estimated out of sample deviance otherwise it can be a pretty noisy estimator for small samples but by doing these adjustments with uh, Pareto smooth important sampling weights uh, you can actually get this to work pretty well even if your uh, sample size is not that large. It does require the dependent variable be the same for all models that you're comparing, and the sample size has to be the same for all of those models. That can be a little bit tricky when you're doing something in r stain arm because if you have missing this on the x's, it's just going to drop those observations. And so if you're comparing models that have different predictors and those predictors have missing this in different places, you can easily get values of n that are different uh, from one model to the next, in which case they're not comparable this way. So you need to make sure you're estimating it on a common data set, and it has to be the same dependent variable. Uh, but you can change the priors, you can change the likelihood function, you can change which predictors you're using, uh, et cetera. Uh, the assumption that I mentioned before, uh, which can be verified, is that no observation is overly influential uh, in this process of determining the posterior distribution of theta conditional on the data. Uh, there's more details in the reading for today. Um, you know, you're not going to be doing this yourself for a while, uh, so it's not particularly important uh, to understand those details. But you can use the same idea of Pareto smooth important sampling weights uh, to reduce the noise and other measures of fit. From a Bayesian perspective, the deviance is really uh, the best one for comparing models, but it's not necessarily the thing that's most intuitive if you're trying to explain this to somebody who doesn't really understand Bayesian statistics or, or quantitative. But you can still use those weights to produce some other measure of fit, uh, and you'll tend to get um, a less noisy estimate that better approximates what would happen uh, if you actually waited for the future data to arrive. And all of these uh, are going to soon, like probably over spring break, be implemented in our Stan Arm and you know other packages that use Stan. When you use Stan directly, uh, and we'll pick this up, you know, starting in April probably. Um, you know, you're going to use Stan. You're going to obtain the posterior distribution. In order to, to calculate the LUIC, you're going to have to be able to write an R function uh, that evaluates the likelihood for the ith observation. So usually when we talk about the likelihood, we're talking about the likelihood for the sample as a whole. Uh, but in this pretty much one case, we're actually talking about the likelihood for the ith observation. And then you, know, you need to be able to evaluate that for all n observations that you have. Um, in this step, you don't have to worry about your priors. It just depends on the likelihood function. Uh, but if you can write such a function in R, pass it uh, to the Lou package, you'll be able to get out the Lou information criteria and the other stuff that we're going to see uh, next. Questions so far? No? Uh, so here's an example of this uh, using the stan lm function and the rstan arm uh, package. Again, going back 
to the diamonds example uh, that we talked about previously. This one has some 50,000 uh, observations. It's in the ggplot2 uh, package. And the model that we estimated uh, last week was a model for the logarithm of the price of the diamond. It depended on uh, the interaction between the carrot uh, and the log width, the log height, and the log depth um, of the diamond, in addition to uh, sort of ordered factors on the quality of the cut, uh, the color of the diamond, the clarity. Uh, I think that's, that's all the variables that were really in the, in the diamonds data set. Uh, <clears throat> since we're taking logarithms, we use the subset. Um, you know, there's a few observations that were measured to have a depth of zero. I don't, it's probably a mistake in the data, but uh, we're just going to exclude those. We just have to remember that we excluded those. Uh, and as we established last time, um, you know, we ought to be pretty optimistic, I think, in our R squared uh, for this model of uh, diamond prices. It seems as if we at least have all the relevant variables here. Like when people rant about like diamonds, um, you know, they're usually talking about the size, the number of carats, um, you know, the cut, the quality, <clears throat> um, the color, etc. There's no like other, you know, feature of the diamond, assuming it's real. Um, <clears throat> that you know, it seems like people are uh, putting a lot of stock in as you know, influencing the price of the diamond. So it seems like we, you know, we pretty much have the right predictors here, and the only question is, is this you know relationship going to be pretty linear? Uh, and that's an open question. Uh, we did it with log prices and log uh, x, y, and z. You know, that's a choice we made. Seems to be a pretty good choice in this case. Maybe it's a choice that has some theoretical um, motivation that it's you know linear in the logarithms in which case it would be multiplicative in the levels. But if you want to estimate a linear model, which is what Stan LM does, uh, you need to do transformations to the variables to make that linear assumption be uh, more plausible. Um, so I put in a prior mode on the R squared of, of 0.8. I think people were saying last time even higher numbers uh, than that. But again, um, it doesn't really matter when you have 50,000 observations if your prior mode was 0.8 or 0.7. Uh, the posterior median comes out to be 0.985 um, in this case, pretty much regardless of what you believed about the R squared going in. So this is really just you know something to get you going. Uh, there was a question on Piazza, I think it was probably private, um, as saying, well, you know, not for the diamonds, but for the, the wages, like, could you just do like frequentist LM uh, with this in order to get an estimate of the R squared and use that, you know, as the prior mode or, or whatever when you call Stan underscore LM. And that's something that seems really plausible to a lot of people, um, particularly if you don't really feel particularly confident. Um, about what to put for R squared, but it's it, mathematically it makes no sense at all. <clears throat> Remember what we're trying to do is take our beliefs now, use condition on data, and then obtain updated beliefs. I think there's too much uh, worrying about you know are your prior beliefs true, because you're never going to be able to verify that. It's not, you know, even really worth worrying about. You just need to express whatever your prior beliefs are, and then the Bayesian machinery gives you the rational way to update those prior beliefs. And so, yeah, I think people are, are saying, well, you know, if I put in, like, wrong priors, then it's going to mess everything up. But that's not true. Even if you have wrong prior beliefs, this is the rational way to update them into posterior beliefs. And you, if you have enough data, then you know it's going to update pretty much all the way 
uh, to the truth if you have the true model. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> the problem with this, and let me see if I can write this on the board. Um, chuck, pistol my chuck. All right, I'll chuck. So if you put in the estimated R squared that you get from like frequentist LM, that depends on the data, Y and X and all that stuff. And so if you put in something like that, your Bayes' rule <coughs> becomes, oops, your prior value for R squared is conditioned on the Y and the data. And then you multiply that by, well, this is more of a, uh, likely to function. So there's another, there's like, uh, you know, other stuff, sigma <coughs> and things like that that go into your prior. And so if you have your prior conditional on y, and then you multiply by likely a function for y conditional on, let's say, let's not write this data, but r squared and sigma, you know, whatever your parameters are, this product is not equal to the joint distribution of r squared, sigma, and y anymore, which is what we need for Bayes' rule to hold. In order for this equality to be true, we can't be conditioning on y here. Then the general multiplication rule holds f of sigma, f of r squared prior, multiplied by a conditional distribution of y given r squared and sigma. Now we have a joint PDF in the numerator for r squared, sigma, and y. So if you have your priors be conditioned on why, then the general multiplication rule doesn't hold anymore. And what you're getting out of this is not a posterior distribution that reflects your beliefs, um, conditional on the data. Now, if, you know, without conditioning on R squared, or without conditioning on Y, you came in and said, like, I believe this, you know, then it goes through. But if you're conditioning on the data in order to arrive at that, and then using the same data to update your beliefs, even though you already, you know, used the data to figure out what you believe about R squared in the first place, you just, you don't get something that corresponds to Bayes' rule anymore. Um, you may get the thing to knit, but it doesn't mean that the output you're getting of it corresponds to what you should believe about these parameters having seen the data. All right? So priors, you know, really do need to be either based on past data that you're not using anymore or, you know, other things that you believed or could have believed uh, before you conditioned on the data that you've collected. Got it? Uh, okay, so we get that posterior distribution. Uh, we can obtain the posterior predictive distribution. Again, uh, this could have been up to 4,000, but then it's sort of a little bit hard for the computer to store a matrix uh, that big. So this is 1,000 draws by like 54,000 observations on diamonds. And we get our posterior predictive beliefs about what the log price should be. So this you can do in log price or you can do an actual price in dollars should come out. Um, I mean, different numbers, but same conclusions. So we can do like we did last time. 
uh, specify the lower 25% quantile for each observation, the upper 75th percent quantile for um, each observation. And according to you know, the rules of probability, if our model is right, it should be the case that like half the observations fall within the respective uh, lower bound or above the lower bound and below the upper bound. Uh, when we construct a 50% credible interval, we can verify uh, the extent to which that is not the case. And in this case, uh, we overfit, but only slightly. So we get about 53% of our observations being caught by 50% or by posterior predictive intervals that are intended to capture the middle 50% uh, of the distribution. So honestly, like if you come up with 53% on a 50% interval, you'd take it every time. Um, you know, when you, if you were to predict future data, uh, you'd probably catch like 45, 46%, something like that in 50% intervals if you extrapolate it out of sample. And for a lot of purposes, purposes that's going to be plenty good enough. Uh, but still, it's worth investigating um, to see, you know, are there, are there problems? Could you do even better? Uh, but, you know, it's going to be rare that on sort of your first take, unless you're a real expert uh, in this area, which I am not in the case of diamonds, that you could just sort of throw down an initial model and have it be calibrated this well, even though it's not perfect. Uh, it's hard to do much better than like 52, 53% in sample. Uh, but in this case, we, we managed to do so. <clears throat> so uh, we can, yeah, yes, Adam? Is there any problem with tinkering with the Bayesian model after you run it? Um, so, what you were saying about conditioning on the yeah. Uh, so ideally, you know, you would do it on new data, but you might not have new data available right now. In which case, no, it's not the worst thing in the world to start modifying your model. Uh, one thing you don't want to do is sort of change your priors, you know, evolve your priors due to stuff that you see on the same data set. Uh, but no, it's, it's you know, fine, uh, you know, compared to the alternatives to, okay, I'm going to do this for, you know, different sets of predictors and stuff like that. Um, it could be uh, better if you'd sort of pre-registered your whole plan um, in advance, saying I'm going to do like these five models and here are my priors and, you know, this is the steps I'm going to perform before you actually go out and collect the data. Um, but if you need to deviate from your pre-registration plan, um, that's not the worst thing in the world as long as you acknowledge like, okay, I did what I said I was going to do, and now it seems it would have been better in retrospect if I'd actually done this, that, and the other. But, you know, these were not stuff that I had anticipated beforehand. So we're going to compare this uh, to another model um, in a second. So to calculate the Lou information uh, criterion, all you have to do is call the Lou function on an object produced by... Uh, one of the functions in our stain arm. So I call Lou on post and assign that to the object Lou underscore post. And you get a uh, long warning, uh, which you should heed, that it found six out of you know, 50,000 observations where this Pareto parameter, which is part of this Pareto important sampling, smoothing noise reduction thing, uh, was greater than 0.7. It's recommending calling Lou again, uh, specifying that as a threshold in order to calculate the Lou information criterion, the expected log predictive uh, deviance <clears throat> without the assumption that these observations are negligible. So this gets back to the assumption that I alluded to when you're calling Lou, you're saying you know each observation has like a small effect on the posterior distribution. And that was mostly true in this case. But for six observations, it seems kind of not true. Um, so if you do its recommendation, it'll refit the model 
only six times, not 50,000 times. And those six times, it'll leave out one observation, obtain the posterior distribution for everybody else, uh, and actually do leave one out cross-validation just for those six. For the remaining, you know, 50,000 minus six, it's just using its estimates that it obtained from the original time uh, <clears throat> that you ran the model. So even though it makes this warning saying like the rest of this is not justified, uh, it still spits out the numbers. Uh, one that you wanna focus on here is the Lu information criterion. So this is negative 70,000. That means nothing in absolute terms. All this Lu information criterion stuff is useful for comparing different models. And in the case of Lu information criterion, uh, the one that has a smaller value, um, counting, you know, more negative is smaller. Um, the smaller value is the model that is expected to predict future data better. This ELPD is simply uh, negative one half of Lu information criterion, so it has exactly the same information. So you want ELPD to be bigger, you want Lu information criterion to be smaller, but Lu information criterion is just negative two times this ELPD business. So they have the same information. The other quantity here is P underscore Lu, which is an estimate of the number of effective parameters in your model. So what's the definition, definition of the number of effective parameters? Uh, the number of effective parameters is loosely speaking uh, the number of parameters that you would have for a model like this that would yield the same amount of precision if you didn't supply any prior information. And so in this case, you actually are supplying uh, prior information, and that tends to reduce the number of effective parameters below the number of nominal parameters. However, the Lu information criterion um, already incorporates the complexity penalty. So a lot of this information criterion stuff, there's gonna be like a misfit component to it and a penalty component to it, depending on how complicated your model is. Uh, but the Lu information criterion already uh, incorporates those things. And we sort of back out this estimate of the effective number of parameters from that. Uh, so we can say, okay, this model is more complicated than that model. But the Lu information criterion already balances the fact that more complicated models tend to predict better in sample, but sometimes predict worse out of sample. However, this estimate of the number of effective parameters is like 264. It has a huge standard error. And you might say, well, why is it telling me the number of effective parameters is 264? when I supplied prior information and there's only 30 nominal parameters in this model. And that's because this estimator in particular is sensitive to the assumption that no observation has an unduly large effect. Um, if you follow this recommendation and you use the updated version of the loop package, you would get something, an estimate that's much closer to 30, uh, which basically is telling you, okay, you supplied some prior information, but it was really a negligible amount of prior information compared to all the information we have in the data on these like 50,000 um, diamonds. So you can see here, most of uh, the observations were just fine. There were a couple in the bad category and four in the really bad category. It basically means like none of these estimates are, are meaningful because they violated the assumption. Um, but, uh, so first thing you might wanna do is investigate which observations those were. Uh, a lot of times when you do this, you find the problematic observations were not coded correctly or something like that. Um, so you can see that the two that are real bad um, up around here, the ones, anything above these lines is, you know, bad to some extent, but most of the points were well uh, into the good areas. So 
you wouldn't have to refit this model uh, very many times. And in fact, um, the Lou function in our stain arm will be able to do this for you. Uh, you can investigate those observations by pulling out the model frame, which is the data frame that was used to estimate the posterior distribution, uh, and you know, see if maybe these are not coded right um, or something like that, which will oftentimes be the case. Uh, so this observation and that observation are the ones that you should really scrutinize uh, because they're the ones that had by far the biggest influence um, on, uh, on the posterior distribution. So like I said, all this Lou information criterion stuff uh, only matters in relative terms. So you have to have two models to compare uh, before you can say, well, which one of these is expected to be better at predicting the data out of sample. So we can estimate a simpler model, which I'll call post-flat, uh, that doesn't have an interaction term. The number of carats just enters linearly along with the log dimensions of the uh, data. And then um, to correct the problem that I had previously, I specify the K underscore threshold as being 0 0.6. So for any observation where it found one of these Pareto parameters being greater than 0 0.6, which I, I think there were six of them, uh, it actually is going to refit the model, leaving out each of those observations uh, to do a more robust calculation uh, of the Lou information criterion. And I do the same thing for the model I just estimated that's a flat model that doesn't have the interaction terms. And then I can call the compare models function in the rstanarm package, giving it a list of the you know, Lou outputs that I want to compare. Um, and we get this thing here, <clears throat> which uh, tells you that the difference in the ELPD uh, for uh, model one versus model two uh, comes out to be like negative 67,000. And this is on the log scale. Um, and this is particularly large relative to the estimated standard error of the difference of like 728. And so what this is telling you is that this flat model that has you know no interaction term is like 100 standard errors worse than the original model that I estimated that did have the interaction terms. And so that is telling you very strongly, very, 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 very strongly uh, that you should include those interaction terms to capture the nonlinear uh, relationship between the carats and the dimensions of the diamond as it relates to the log price. Adam. And that conclusion was worse based on the negative sign of the difference. Yeah. And which you said in first and second. Right, right, right. Uh, so remember, bigger ELPD is good. And so it, it did like two minus one or something like that. And so it came out with a negative. Uh, 67,000 is strongly favoring the first model uh, that has the interaction terms relative to the flat model that doesn't. But you could just put them up separately to eyeball them to make sure that you're not misinterpreting them. Uh, but what you'll find is the difference in the ALPD is uh, quite large, quite large. So the model with interaction terms is much better than the one without it. Um, okay, so some things that are not the Lou information criterion. One is the ELPD, but it's just negative one half of the Lou information criterion, so it's going to rank models the same way. It's just flipping around whether positive is good or negative is good. There's another thing called the widely applicable information criterion, which is asymptotically equivalent to the Lou uh, IC, but it's not as robust and its assumptions are not as easy to verify. So you shouldn't use it, even though there was like a month where Andrew Gelman was uh, advocating for it. Um, the deviance information criterion goes back uh, to the 1990s. It's equivalent to the widely applicable information criterion if your posterior distribution is multivariate normal. Uh, but there's no reason why you would want to assume that. Finally, there's the AIC, which is equivalent to the DIC, um, assuming flat priors 
for everything. So the AIC, the Akaki Information Criterion, is something you might have heard of before. Frequent is used, uh, even though it has sort of a Bayesian kind of justification to it. Uh, but the reason why frequentists prefer it is because it's assuming no prior information being imparted uh, about the parameters. There's another thing called the Bayesian information criterion, uh, which is and sounds Bayesian, uh, but it's not really an information criterion. It's not comparable to the LUIC or the WAC or the DIC or the AIC. It's telling you uh, something different. <clears throat> and, it, and we'll talk about this maybe more after spring break, but um, the BIC is an approximation to the difference in the Bayes factor. And the Bayes factor is, you know, the probability that model J is correct given the data, um, you know, relative to some other model. And this Bayes factor business um, depends on your sort of prior probability that model J is the best one multiplied by the denominator of Bayes' rule. And so this isn't really directly calculable, except in the few cases where we can get the denominator analytically. Or what the BIC does is assume multivariate normality. And if that's the case, then we can also approximate the denominator of Bayes' rule and get an approximation to this thing. Uh, but the, the BIC and the Bayes factor have some pretty severe limitations to them. Um, and so what we sort of currently think is the best is to just emphasize the Lew information criterion to evaluate which model uh, is likely to predict future data the best. And that's a pretty simple uh, and robust criterion that you can use to compare different models that have the same outcome and have the same number of observations. All right. Uh, okay. So um, if you haven't seen already, you know, I put up a new syllabus actually a couple weeks ago, uh, and it has readings that on hierarchical models that we'll start to get into um, not this upcoming Tuesday because it's spring break, but the Tuesday after that.